Hello, and welcome to Western Washington History. Why a floating bridge and not a suspension bridge like the Narrows? We will answer that and more questions you may have about the Hood Canal floating bridge. As shown on this map, for someone on the Kitsap Peninsula or even in Seattle to get across the Hood Canal, you would have to make a long trip around the Hook. Some of you know that feeling all too well as you had to drive around while they rebuilt the bridge a few years ago. Of course, the native tribes paddled all over this area for many years before the settlers came. In 1908, Helge and Sophia Loval moved to the Kitsap Peninsula side of Hood Canal and started a town. The next year, they had a store and a dock and the steamer named State of Washington began stopping there twice a week. Now Loval was on the map. Their daughter asked if they could change the name of the town to Lofal to make it sound more American, and they did. That is what the area is called today. What does this have to do with the bridge? It is backstory. Oh, beautiful backstory. By the 1930s, roads were everywhere, and it was no longer profitable to run the steamboats. They realized they still needed service across the canal to access Port Angeles, Port Townsend, and the rest of the communities out that way. So they set up a ferry to run just south of Salisbury Point across the canal to Shine. In 1950, Blackball Ferry Line bought the service and moved the dock to Lofal and crossing over to South Point. When the state took over the ferry system in 1951, it kept the service where it was until 1961. The Hood Canal Bridge had been talked about for nearly a decade before construction began. A pontoon or floating bridge was agreed upon. The reason for the floating bridge is because the depth varies from 80 feet to over 300 feet. As you can imagine, a 300 foot underwater support would be costly. And it wasn't only the depth, the tide can change up to 18 feet. This would be the first pontoon bridge to be built on salt water. A floating bridge was usually reserved for lakes with very little rise in water level. With its one and a half mile length, the Hood Canal Bridge is the longest salt water floating bridge in the world and the fourth longest floating bridge altogether. Over 19,000 vehicles cross it every day. The Hood Canal Bridge cost $25 million to build. That would be $218 million today. Construction was started and the pontoons and other parts were made in Seattle. In 1958, two pontoons sank in the Duwamish waterway, helping what would end up being a 15-month delay in the bridge opening. Another cause of the delay were bolts that were damaged during a storm while the bridge was being built. That prompted a change in design and a change in contractor. Even with all the problems and delays, the bridge officially opened August 12, 1961. Traffic was backed up for at least five miles with people wanting to travel on the new bridge. The original bridge had approach spans and truss spans built on piers. In between those are 23 floating hollow concrete pontoons with 93 cells each, each weighing about 5,000 tons. Those are held in place by braided steel cable tied to 42 concrete block anchors, each weighing over 500 tons. At the center of the floating part is a pontoon draw span that opens to 600 feet to allow large ships and submarines to pass. The Hookenau Bridge is part of State Route 104, which connects the Kitsap Peninsula with the Olympic Peninsula. The Hood Canal Bridge was officially renamed in 1977 to the William A. Bug Hood Canal Bridge. Bug served as Washington's Director of Highways from 1949 to 1963. There were more maintenance issues than your average suspension bridge, but the Hood Canal Bridge did its job and stayed afloat until it didn't. Eighteen years into his life, on February 13, 1979, there were gusts of up to 100 miles per hour. There had been a low tide earlier that day, and the cables holding the pontoons had gotten slack in them. Meanwhile, the wind and current was pushing the bridge in the same direction. When bridge tender Charles Myers arrived at 2 a.m., the bridge was bowing. He immediately pinned, he immediately opened the drawbridge span to allow some of the current to pass through. It helped some. At 6.30 that morning, George Tyner, another bridge tender, showed up to help. The wind gusts were reaching 100 miles per hour. 15-foot tall waves were crashing over the deck of the bridge, flooding the pontoons. Myers and Tyner were in the control tower when it started to tip. They ran out of it and got into Tyner's truck. Just as they got in and started to drive off, a pontoon on the west side broke off and sank, along with Myers' Plymouth Fury. Within 10 minutes, they watched 12 pontoons sink. Thanks to opening the draw span, the eastbound pontoon stayed afloat. There was no loss of life, not even a scared dog like the Tacoma Narrows, only a few Washington Department of Transportation trucks in that poor Plymouth. The pontoons and their anchors were left at the bottom of the Hood Canal.
After the storm subsided, divers were sent in to investigate. They found that the storm had snapped the cables, which were three feet in diameter. An independent consulting firm concluded that the storm had moved three anchors tied to the first pontoon just west of the draw span. The more immediate need was a way to get people back and forth. People had grown dependent on this bridge, and the drive around put at least an extra 50 miles of travel on the trip. The state got the docks at Low Fall and South Point back up and running. At first, they ran a passenger ferry with bus connections at both ends and placed a jumbo ferry on the temporary Edmonds to Port Townsend run. A series of barges were tied together with a ramp at each end and a wheelhouse added. After debates and ideas ranging from a tunnel under the water to a suspension bridge and everything in between, they settled on rebuilding the floating bridge. In the 18 years since construction, a lot of innovations had been made in floating technology, largely in part to the floating oil drilling rigs. One of the few new design features was the larger, heavier anchors. Also, the cables would now go three directions instead of only one. In spring of 1980, they used a barge for cars with buses tied to the deck for passengers. They had an accident with a tug. They then brought in the ferries Tilcom and Colshan for the rest of that year. The rebuilt bridge was open to traffic in 1982. As a precaution, the bridge would be closed if the wind reached 40 miles per hour for 15 minutes. With the bridge open, the ferries went to service another area. A year later, some other repairs were needed and ferry service was resumed for a short time. With the westbound section being rebuilt in 1982, the east side now needed repairs. So in 2003, they started to rebuild the east side while building a dock to build the bridge parts at near Eddie's Hook at Port Angeles, they uncovered graves and a lot of native artifacts. They had to discontinue work and start back up in Tacoma. Meanwhile, the archaeological dig site at Port Angeles had become the largest ever in Washington State. Now you know a little history about this fascinating bridge. Please, if you made it this far, like the video and subscribe if you haven't. We also have a store, the link is in the description. We can have any photo you like put onto a canvas or a poster or a large number of other items. Until next time, remember, what you do today will be history tomorrow, so make it count.